Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday night for Bible study. We ask that you will click the share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. You know, there is no God like our God. He is faithful. What he says he will do, he will do. He loves us unconditionally, and his love is everlasting. I just thank God on tonight for just loving us and keeping us through everything that we're, we're going through in life. So on tonight, we just want to thank and praise God for his many blessings that he's bestowed upon us. Our scripture will come from 1 Chronicles 16 and 34, and it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Thank you, Lord.
Father God, we thank you now. God, we glorify you. We magnify you. We lift your holy name. We thank you for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us and keeping us and molding and shaping us, Lord. God, we thank you, Father God, for your ever-present mercy. Your mercy, your grace that exists from one generation to the other. We thank you for this privilege tonight to be forgiven by you. Yes. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. Yes. Forgive us for our missteps. Forgive us for missing the mark. Yes. Bless us, Lord, that we will stick to you, stick with you, and obey you. Yes. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we study your word, that your word will become real to us, yes. that your word will fall on good soil, that your word, Father God, will be pleasing to us and pleasing to you. That we will carry out your word. That we will enjoy your word. That your word will speak to us. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. Amen. And thank God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. Amen. Tonight is a great night to to thank the Lord for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. We just honor the God that we serve because he is worthy of all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Amen. We're in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. The verses for tonight will be 24 through 26. Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 26. While you're looking for that, while you're finding that in the New Testament, I want to remind you that we will be having our virtual uh, communion on Sunday. We will be having our virtual communion. So go out and get what you need to, to, to eat with us and to drink with us in our virtual communion on Sunday. Meaning that we will have it in our, our 1045 service. We will drink here and you will drink there and eat there. Amen. So thank you so much for joining us uh, for our Bible study on tonight. Colossians chapter 1. Verses 24 through 26, Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 26. When you found it, you will discover these words. I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which... I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Paul is speaking here and he's still talking to the church at Colossae. Uh, theologians believe that he never took a trip to visit the church at Colossae, but he oftentimes wrote to them because of his love for them and because he had heard good news about them and how they were making the transition from heresy to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we come to you tonight to talk about how the apostle Paul was rejoicing in his suffering. He says he was rejoicing in his suffering. He says, now uh, uh, I rejoice in my suffering. Paul says, at this point in my life, I have grown to a point where I can actually rejoice in the midst of my suffering. My question to you tonight is, can you say that you rejoice in the midst of your suffering? This word suffering is hardship. This word suffering is pain. The word suffering is 
his passion. So are you rejoicing in the midst of your pain? Are you rejoicing in the midst of your hardship? Are you rejoicing in the midst of your passion? This word passion doesn't mean a desire to do some things or to, a desire to accomplish some things. This word passion is in line with what we know as the passion of Christ. The movie, The Passion of Christ, does not talk about the desire that Christ had to give his life for us. Rather, it talks about the suffering of Christ. So this word passion is the suffering. The word passion means the hardship and the pain that the Apostle Paul is going through, just as Jesus was going through in that movie called The Passion of Christ. So Paul says, I rejoice. Paul is saying to us, I am doing well. I'm well off. This word rejoice means to be well off, to be glad, to be, to be cheerful, to be excited. Paul says, I'm excited. I'm well off. I'm glad and I'm cheerful. I'm rejoicing in the fact that I have this privilege of suffering. How many of you tonight consider it a privilege to suffer for the Lord? How many of you consider it a privilege to suffer for other people? How many of you consider it a, a privilege to suffer from, for the church and for Jesus the Christ? Look at what Paul says. He says, for now I am, I now rejoice in my suffering. And then he says, I'm suffering for you. Let me just tell you, there are some things that the Apostle Paul suffers for, and you will, you will see it written throughout Philippians and throughout Colossians, as well as Ephesians. There are some things that Paul is suffering for. Number one, Paul is suffering because of his past. The Apostle Paul is suffering because of his mean, killing past. The Apostle Paul is suffering because he had a past. His past was not something that he was to brag about. But he, he is suffering because men remember his past. Men remember what he used to be like. Men remember who he used to be and what he was. There are some of you today who have left your old way, have, have turned to the, the way of the Lord. You are now on the Lord's side. And even though you're on the Lord's side, somebody is remembering your past. And every, every chance they get, every time they get it, they get an opportunity. They remind you of who you used to be. Yes. They remind you of your past. You got to remind them of your future. I'm on my way to heaven now. I'm on my way to be with the Lord. And while I'm here, I'm going to be, be blessed of the Lord and I'm going to walk with the Lord. Don't let people remind you of your past and jeopardize your future because of your past. And don't let them jeopardize your present because of your past. So the Apostle Paul suffers throughout his writing. He identifies the fact that he's suffering, number one, because of his past. Number two, he suffers, and he talks about it throughout his writing. He suffers because of Christ's sake. He suffers for the sake of Christ. He suffers, Paul, the Apostle Paul, as every other Christian ought to suffer because of Christ's sake. We are Christians. We are Christians. We are Christians. And because we are Christians, we are Christ-like, we suffer just like Christ does. Yes, so Paul says here that I'm suffering for the sake of Christ. And then the thing he points out in verse number 24, he says, I'm suffering for you, the church. He says, I'm suffering for you. I'm, I am suffering for your sake. He's writing to the church at Colossae. These old Gentiles, these who have, have Gentile blood, those who were not Jews, he's writing to them to let them know that I'm suffering because of you. I am willingly, I'm rejoicingly suffering for your sake. How many of you suffer for the sake of Christ? How many of you suffer for the sake of your past? How many of you suffer for the sake of your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? 
Paul says, I'm suffering for you. He, he says, I'm suffering for you. And, and the, uh, the thing that you can say here, not only is he suffering for the church at Colossae who has been redeemed, he's also suffering for the Gentile world. Paul's ministry was geared toward the Gentiles. Paul's ministry was geared toward those who were left out and left over. Paul's ministry was geared toward those who were not a part of of the upper echelon. Paul says, I'm suffering for the Gentiles. I'm suffering for the church of Jesus Christ. I'm suffering for you. Paul says, I'm suffering. And, and in my suffering, I'm not complaining. In my suffering, I've learned to be a base. I've learned to abound. I've learned to whatsoever state I am to therein to be content. Paul says, I'm suffering. He says, I'm suffering. He says, I have hardships. I have pain. I have passion. I, I go through trouble because and for you. He says, and fill, and fill up in my flesh. Paul says, I'm, 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 I'm suffering in my flesh. I, I am suffering deep down in my flesh because I am substituting myself for you. He says that I have come, I have become a, I have become a substitute for you. When people would normally accuse you, when they would normally beat up you, when they normally would run you out of town, they're running me out of town in your stead. Paul says, I'm suffering in the flesh. I am, I am filled up in my flesh. He, he says, he feel, I'm a substitute. This word, this phrase, fill up, I'm a substitute for you in my flesh. Don't look over that word flesh. Because Paul is talking about the fact that I'm your substitute in the flesh, meaning while I'm living. I'm the substitute in your flesh while I'm living. Because it's careful to note that because when you look at the next following phrase, he says, what is lacking in the affliction of Christ. He says, I'm suffering for you in my flesh, meaning as I live, as I walk, as I'm still on planet earth, I'm suffering for you in my flesh. He says, what is lacking? What is lacking in the affliction of Christ? Now, don't, don't, don't get all bent out of shape here. Because he is not saying that he's a substitute of what Christ could not do. What he is saying is, in the flesh, in my body, in my members, while I'm living, I'm a substitute for you. I am suffering for you when you ought to be suffering yourself. But he's saying it was lacking in Christ. In other words, Christ is no longer here to suffer in the flesh for you. But he is saying that Christ suffered once for all and for everybody. Yes. You see what he's doing here is he's painting a picture in the flesh of what God has done through Jesus Christ in the spirit. What he's saying is I'm suffering in the flesh for what was lack, what is lacking, what is lacking, what is presently lacking in the affliction of Jesus Christ. Jesus was afflicted for you. Jesus was tormented for you. Jesus even died for you. Yes, he He's saying, Jesus is no longer here to suffer for you. I'm suffering for you. Let me tell you, it's, it, it is a picture of someone who is ultimately in charge. Someone who has the last word. It is a picture of someone who will tell you that I'm held accountable for it. And if you're going to lead, if you're going to successfully lead anything, successfully lead any organization, successfully lead any nation, you got to have yourself at a point where you have total responsibility. Yes. Those who do not successfully lead are those who do not hold themselves accountable and those who do not assume responsibility. Paul says, I'm suffering for you. But what he wants you to know is that Jesus Christ was afflicted for you. He even died for you. Yes. Jesus even, don't, don't compare 
Paul to Jesus because he is not making that comparison. He's not saying that he is the one that's coexisting with Jesus. He's not saying that he is the co-redeemer with Jesus. What he is saying is Jesus is gone now. The Holy Spirit is present. He's saying even though Jesus is gone, gone the saints have to still suffer for Christ's sake says that what is lacking in the what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body Jesus is the great head of the church Jesus is the founder of the church Jesus is the one who leads the church he allows us to be a part of the church so Paul is saying that he is suffering here and he is, he is suffering in what is lacking to Jesus, in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, he's also saying Jesus have already given his life for you. What Jesus did in the dying for you, I'm showing you in the physical while I'm still living. So Jesus has died for you. Don't get it mixed up because the fact of the matter is no man, not even Paul, no man, not even David, Elijah, no man has become the substitute for Jesus Christ. Jesus is a great substitute for us. He took our sins. He took it and he died for us. He put it on his shoulder, walked up Golgotha. He died on a skull hill called Calvary. Jesus the Christ is the great substitute for us. Amen. Says for the sake of his body. The reason why Paul says for the sake of his, the sake of Christ's body, the sake of Jesus Christ's body, the sake of the Christ's body is because Jesus Christ is the one who owns the church. No pastor owns the church. Now, the pastor may pay for a building. He may get a building. He may get, put his money down on the building. But the bottom line, he does not own the body of Christ. God forbid any man other than Christ, the God man, owns the church, the body of Christ. That's why it's dangerous when the pastor says, my people, my church. My folk. Well, first of all, you don't belong to me. Secondly, I don't own you. And thirdly, and more importantly, I did not die for you and will not die for you. But Jesus Christ has already died for you. He has died. He's given his, his church, his body. He's given his church, his spirit. He owns the body. And he goes on to say in verse number 24, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 24, he goes on to say, his body, for the sake of his body, which is the church. Jesus has died for the sake of his body. Men cannot claim ownership. Jesus already has that ownership. Jesus the Christ is the only one who died for the church. He's the only one who voluntarily gave his life for the church. Jesus of Christ did. Verse 25 says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God, which was given to me for you. He became a minister. In, in the previous pericope on last week, we talked to you about the fact that Paul has been called to be a minister unto Jesus Christ. He has been called to, to walk with God and to obey God for the sake of the church. Every pastor, every minister, every preacher, every man of God has been called for the sake of the church to minister according to the stewardship of God, which was given to him for you or for the church. So we're, we're not here ministering for our own sakes. We're not here ministering because of our own little selfish reasons, I hope. We're not here to make a name for ourselves, I pray. We are here because we're called to the stewardship of God. That's why Paul says, 
Paul says that I want to know him. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, I want to know him in the stewardship. I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. We got to get to the point in our lives where we understand that rain must fall on the just as well as the unjust. We must understand that we have to go through some things. If you never go through anything, how can you testify how God brought you out? You got to go through something. Let me tell you, when you've been sick and you've been sick as you can be, you got a brand new testimony when you come out. When, when you go through something and, and when, you, when you're broke and you can't pay your bills, you got more month than you have bills. You go through something, you got a different respect for the Lord and how he brought you out. Amen. And let me just share with you, if you've never gone through anything, if I'm not on your street yet, just keep waking up in the morning. Sooner or later, later you're going to go through something. If it's not your friends disappointing you, you're going to go through something. If it's not your family turning their backs on you, sooner or later, you're going to go through something. You will suffer, and some of us will have to suffer for Christ's sake. Our families won't always be there, but Christ will. We have to get to a point where we understand that we must suffer for the sake of Christ. Paul says that I'm suffering, and I became a minister according to the stewardship of God. This word stewardship is, is dispensation. I have, I, at this point in my life, I'm suffering. I am suffering according to the dispensation from God for this appointed time. I'm appointed to go through some suffering. Yeah. I'm appointed to go through some things. Whether it's sickness, whether it's unemployment, whether it's homelessness, you're going to go through something. And there are people who walk around and act like they really got it going on. They act like they never going to go through anything. Just keep waking up. Sooner or later, it's going to become your time. And when it becomes your time, you better make sure that God is on your side and make sure you had mistreated people because you're going to need somebody. Regardless of how holy you are, regardless of how close you walk with God and how closely you stuck with God, sooner or later you're going to need somebody. You're going to need somebody in the flesh. Paul says, I have become the person in the flesh for you. Paul says, I have, come, I have come to the point where I am under the, the auspices of the Holy Spirit, under the leadership of God, the stewardship from God, which is given to me for your sake, for you. To fulfill the word of God. Ministers are called to fulfill the word of God. Ministers are called, and you may drive what you want to drive, go where you want to go, wear what you want to wear. But at the end of the day, if you're not fulfilling the word of God, you're not much of a minister. Pastor Reginald Rose says it really well. He says that if a preacher's wardrobe is more important and more expensive than his library, he's not much of a preacher. Amen. He says that, that if your wardrobe, if the stuff you put on your back is more expensive than the stuff you put on your heart and in your heart, you're not much of a minister. You, you're saying something, you, you're getting opportunities, but if your study habits are just those habits when you study just to get up and talk to people, you're not doing much study. If you can take the word and pick the word up, and as you pick the word up, you go ahead and pick it up, and in five minutes you're ready, you're not studying. You're not putting anything in you. And if you're only studying for a presentation, you are pretty bad off. You are slopping the hogs. You're not feeding the sheep. Paul says, I'm called to be a minister. And him called to be a minister for the sake of fulfilling the word of God. I am called to fulfill 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am called to pass on good news. In these times that we live in, it is a time for people to pass out good news. It is time for ministers to pass out good news. Tell this dying world that God yet sat on the throne. Tell this dying world that God is yet living, that God is real. You got to tell this dying world that, that God is still in control. Because men don't know that God is in control. They think the White House is controlling something. And he doesn't even have a decent vocabulary. He can't even put together real good paragraphs. And they think he's in control. There are men and women who are following after the man, the orange man in the White House, because they call him president, they following him. But I'm telling you, the men of God ought to be standing with the word of God, teaching and preaching the word of God, so lives will be changed. Amen. We're in a pandemic. The word of God has an opportunity to go forth. And let me just stop and say something to the associate minister right here. You are called to minister. Yes. You are called to give the word out. You don't have to be behind the pulpit in order to give the word. If you're an associate, God deliver me from associates that complain because the pastor won't let him get in the pulpit. Well, you do well with a few good things and God elevates you to great things. Yes. You do well with just a little bit. God deliver me from the, the, the singer who, who wants to sing a solo but won't join the choir and sing with everybody else. Mm -hmm. God deliver me from the usher who wants to serve the pastor but who won't serve the door. All right. God deliver me from the musician who, who wants to have a solo in music but they won't play when they need them to play. There are too many, there are too many musicians who, who want to play their own way, play their own thing, and they refuse to play when they're asked because you won't let me do it my way. You're called to minister. You're called to minister unto the Lord. You're called to minister to the Lord's people. You are called, if you are a, a musician who's a minister, if you are an usher who's a minister, because we're all called to ministry. And if you're, you're called to, to play an instrument because you are a minister, you ought to get joy out of doing it. Paul says, I rejoice in this. And when it doesn't go my way, Paul says, I'm still called to minister. I just keep right on ministering. Say it to a young man, just keep playing music. And I knew I had to unpack that and explain that to him because... David, even when Saul ran behind him, even when Saul pointed a spear at him, even when Saul was trying to, trying to take his life, even when Saul had a conspiracy going on against him, he kept playing music. And he played music for the benefit of Saul because he ministered to Saul. I want to say to you today, if things not going right in your life, just keep playing music. Every preacher, every preacher that's out of the pulpit right now, just keep preaching. Just keep studying. And every preacher that, that, that is not behind the, the podium right now, you ought to be in school. You ought to be getting some learning. You ought to be reading the word of God. You ought to be studying the word of God. You ought to be called and you ought to exemplify your calling because of your hunger, your thirst, and your desire for the word of God. I've been telling you for the last four weeks that, that it's in the word. Jesus says it is written. Jesus says when, when the devil approached him and said, go ahead and jump, go and jump. The, the Lord will give his angels charge over you and they will bear you up. Jesus says it is written. Gave him the word that you should not tempt the Lord thy God. Yes. He says, hey, you hungry, Jesus? Go ahead and turn this stone or stones into bread. Jesus says, it is written. Right. 
It is written. And, and the fact is, what is written is the fact that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. We have to study the word. We are called for the word. And how you going to, how will you be able to dispense the word if you don't know the word? You see, when I grew up, Pastor, Pastor Allen may have been an eighth grade graduate as a pastor. But you see, the audience that he was talking to were third grade graduates or dropouts. We, we, cannot, we cannot talk about the fact that the Lord will give us a word at a given notice. Without a given notice, the, the Lord will bring it up out of me. If it's not in you, God can't bring it out of you. Right. We're called to minister. We're called to give hope to people. We're called to help, help the devil stay on the run. We're called to bring light into dark places. If you're born again, if you're saved, when you walk in the room, it doesn't matter how dark and dismal it is. When you walk in the room, light just showed up. Mm. It doesn't matter if somebody has died. It doesn't matter if somebody is at the verge of dying. It doesn't matter if there have been a bad accident. It doesn't matter even if it's your family member. When you walk in the room, things ought to change. Mm. People ought to look at you and say, oh, he's coming to minister. Uh-uh, she, she's here now, and because she's here, uh, she has come to minister. We're called to minister. We're, we're called to give hope. We're, we're called to bandage people broken lives up again. People ought to be able to call you and get a word from the Lord. People ought to be able to call you, and you ought to pray for them and lift their spirits. You ought not make folk worse than they were before they met you. You ought to always leave a person better than when they were when you showed up. That's right. Paul says, I'm called to fulfill the word of God. Verse 26, he says, the mystery. He describes the word of God. He describes the hope that we have. He, he says, we are, I am here to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. This word mystery in our day means something that's mysterious. This word mystery means something that is eerie. This word mystery means something that is frightening and something that, that we can't know about. It is what some people look at the book of Revelation and think, I can't read that. But the Bible says, if you read it, you will be blessed. Right. This word mystery in our day means frightening. But in Paul's day, this word mystery in the original Greek form was a sacred secret. And you must understand here that during those days, they had false prophets as we have today. And these false prophets was passing out heresy. And as they passed out heresy, it was concealed to a small little group of people. And this, this heresy, this false teaching that they were passing out was concealed to this small group of people in such a way that they were able to hang it over other folk head and say, I have this and you don't have it. Is that familiar? <laughs> well, people will always say, well, I know this and you don't know it. It's, it's the pride of life. When, when some folk go on their job, they, they have a new recruit come on their jobs and, and they don't want to show the recruit everything they know. I need to keep this carrot hanging over his head. I have to make sure they call me out when I need when they need this done. Let me tell you, when I was a technician and an engineer, I wanted to make sure that my understudies knew everything that I knew. Because two o'clock in the morning calls are no fun. If I can tell him 
everything I know, and then he can learn more than I know, then I can sleep in at two in the morning and he can get up and run out there and fix it. That's how it was in Paul day. They they had these guys who were who were heretics. They passed out false doctrine. And as they passed out false doctrine, they concealed these false doctrine and they held it over other men and women's head and said, I know something that you don't know. And these are supposed to have been religious people. These are supposed to have been people who, who love the Lord God. But Paul says. This mystery has been passed from one generation and from one age to the other. But now at this season, it's been revealed to the saints of God. You know, people like to walk around and say, say God works in mysterious ways. But keep reading the verse. Keep reading the passage. Keep reading the pericope. God works in mysterious ways, but it's been revealed to his saints. God, God, God has set Paul as he has set ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has set them up to minister the great mysteries of the word of God. We are to minister the great mysteries of the word of God. You don't have to be a missionary. You don't have to have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a, a minister of music. You are to minister with what God has given you. Mm -hmm. During this time, during this time when, when we're not eye to eye and we are not able to see each other and be around each other right now, you ought to have a ministry. Somebody ought to have a ministry to children, to wayward children. You ought to have a ministry to, to, to bad children. You ought to have a ministry that, that lifts up the poor and the weak. You ought to have a ministry to the elderly. You ought to have a ministry that's going on. Even if you have to do it electronically, even if you have to do it by email, even if you have to do it by Facebook, even if you have to do it by internet. We have all these means by which we can continue to minister to people. If you are not mentoring someone, then you are not ministering to someone. There ought to be somebody in your life, if not several people, that you're ministering to. Because you're called to reveal the great mysteries. Even if you go to the hospital when they let you in and just read the Bible to those who can't read. Somebody's ministry ought to be to go to the hospital even if you work there, you ought to take an hour a day after you get off and sit in somebody's room or go from room to room and just read a verse or two, read a Bible, read a chapter. It's not too much. We're called to minister. We're called to, to lift up somebody's spirit. We're called to be on our mission every day. What can we do? If you, are, if you are a baker, you can bake tea cakes. Make some tea cakes for people that want something or need something. All these guys that say they're homeless down the road, you ought to reach in your, your pocket, reach, reach in your car and give them something. I have chosen not to give money. I give a bottle of water. I, I give food. I have chosen not to give money. Find a way to minister to people. Paul says, I've been called a minister and I'm rejoicing in it. And he says, it's been passed on this hidden mystery, been passed from one generation and one age, one season to the other. What he's saying is in the Old Testament, they didn't have the word of God as we have it today. Because there's an Old Testament, right? There's a New Testament, right? The New Testament didn't exist in during the days of the Old Testament. That's why Jesus quoted Deuteronomy. That's why Jesus and, and Paul and all the rest of them quoted the Old Testament because the New Testament was being written as they walked. So here we have both the Old Testament and the New Testament and we quote none of it. <laughs> we ought to live 
by the word. We ought to, we ought to make sure that we minister to people. Whatever your gift is, let God use you in that gift. Because when you're waiting on God to bless you, you ought to be ministering in that area so God can bless you. Yes, Lord. If I want something, I ought to be ministering to somebody who doesn't have it. If I want God to bless me in this area, I need to be giving all I have to minister somebody, to bless somebody along this narrow way. So yeah, yeah, you, you always say that, that it's, been, it's been a secret. It's been a mystery. This gospel is a mystery. I want to tell you, it has been revealed. This word mystery means that it has, has been kept silent. This word mystery in the original Greek means that it's a closed mouth. But, but God says he has revealed it to his saints. And because he's revealed it to his saints, we, have, we do have something that others don't have. If you're saved, if you're born again, God is able to give a revelation to you through his word and through, your, your, through his spirit that no one else is able to receive because you're saved, because you're born again. So it has been, it has been revealed. It has been revealed to those who are the saints of God. It has been revealed. It has been delivered to us. Word reveal means the cover has been taken off it. The word reveal means that it has that the, 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 the it has been delivered in such a way that we can see plainly now. We can see it plainly because the Holy Spirit, he tells us as we read the word, the Holy Spirit tells us what God is really saying. But you have to be. You got to be. You must be born again. And being born again, it's not running, jumping, shouting, crying out with other tongues. These things you may do, that's left up to you and the Holy Spirit. But what you must do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, and he rose from the dead. And then God can open up this mystery. Receive him tonight. Invite him into your life tonight. So God can, can reveal himself to you through this great gospel that he has left for us. This great gospel that Jesus has, has given us. This great gospel, this mystery that has been a mystery down through ages past and from one generation to the other. Those of you who've never received Jesus Christ, this is your moment. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Well, come to Jesus so you can experience this great mystery. And not only will you be able to experience the mystery, not only will you be able to understand this word of God we talk about, we preach about, we sing about, you will be able to be blessed by God as you enter into a new life with him. Yeah, God works in mysterious ways, but the Bible says, it has been revealed. Don't you want the word of God to be revealed unto you? Because it's God's word that keeps us. It's God's word throughout which we get our faith to grow. It is God's word that makes us who we are. You see, when we have God's word, when we have God's word, we can depend on that word. We can depend on God's word in such a way that it gives us hope. Yes. It gives us strength. And God's word gives us favor. Don't you want God's word? Don't you want to be a part of this great body, the body of Christ, the church? You see, you don't join the church. You're born into the church. Yes. And as you're born into the church, you're able to receive God's word and God is able to reveal it unto you, to uncover it, to present it. Will you join me in prayer right now and invite Christ into your life to be your Lord and your Savior? 
just repeat after me in this little simple prayer and invite Christ into your life, believing the story of his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's bow our head and you pray with me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe that if you invited Jesus Christ into your life, believing in his death, burial, and resurrection, that you're now saved. You're born again. You're on your way to heaven. You don't have to confess Christ as your Savior ever again. We believe that Jesus Christ died once for all, and you only have to receive him one time. But you do need to continue to walk with Christ and continue to allow him to be the Lord of your life. Join a good Bible teaching church where the word of God is being revealed. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship. Where Jesus is the main attraction where Jesus is the one who we look to. Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, he is, he is our Lord and he's our Savior. If you have joined our church through this new birth experience tonight, inbox me and let me know that you've joined. If you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church, please inbox me and let me know that you'd like to be a part of the New Beginning Church. And you don't have to be in Houston. You can be all over this land. We'll be glad to welcome you to the church. And if you need prayer, inbox me. Let me know that, that you need prayer. And several people have, have called for prayer, who have asked for prayer. We'll be glad to pray with you and pray for you. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for being with us tonight. And Whatever you do, keep being a sacrificial person that's giving your life for the ministry for the kingdom of God. Yes, Jesus was the ultimate, ultimate sacrifice, but we need to sacrifice ourselves. Not for death, not unto death, but in service to the Lord. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can do so by three different means. You can do so by cash app. Our cash, our cash tag is NBC Souls, dollar sign NBC Souls. You can give by way of cash app, dollar sign, or cash app NBC Souls. You can give by way of Zelle by our email. Our Zelle email is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can give through mail. You can mail it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box. 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 We'll be glad to receive your tithes, your offering, your sacrificial gifts and let me thank the New Beginning Church members as well as our visitors for supporting our ministry during this time Thank you so much for having a right relationship, a right fellowship with Jesus Christ by supporting financially and uh, being a blessing to the kingdom of God. 
Please, ma'am, please, sir, remember that we have Bible study this time every Wednesday night at 7.20 p.m. Please continue to join us as you have tonight at 7.20 p.m. for Bible study. Join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. for Sunday school. And also, we look forward to hearing you and seeing you and, and worshiping with you for our worship service at 10.45 a.m. Worship service on every Sunday morning. Please remember that we have communion this Sunday. We have communion where we will fellowship with the Lord and thank God for what he has done and how he has blessed us. And so we will be participating in communion. So go out and get your drink and get your, your bread and crackers or whatever you may have as a symbol. We want to make sure we do this in remembrance of what Jesus has already done. So join us at our 1045 service for communion. We'll be glad to have you share and break bread with you. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We, we honor you. We praise you. We magnify you. We thank you for being good and being God. Thank you for another chance, another opportunity, Lord to be sacrificial gifts, sacrificial servants unto you, to be ministers unto you, to be those who carry the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Bless everyone under my voice, Father God, those who are watching, those who will watch. Bless them, Father God, to be about your business. Bless them to, to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Lord, we ask you to comfort those who are weak, comfort the bereaved, strengthen those who are bowed down, give them hope that have hopeless situations. Lord, we ask you to keep us now as a church, as a universal church, as a local body of believers. We ask you to keep our buildings and keep us strong. Lord, give us a hunger, a thirst, and a desire for your word, that your word will go forward, Lord, that your word will change not only our lives, but the lives of so many others. Prepare us, Father God, to, to reveal your word as you reveal your word unto us. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us all say together, amen, amen, and amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God bless you. God keep you. John 12, 32, we pray God's blessings upon your life. Be blessed.